I'll welcome everyone to today's grants and sponsored research initiative or GRIT seminar hosted by the Research Program on Children in Adversity or the RPCA at the Boston College School of Social Work. My name is Teresa Betancourt. I'm the Salem Professor of Global Practice at the School of Social Work and Director of the RPCA. This seminar series was founded as part of our Youth Forward U19 Implementation Science Hub funded by the National Institute of Mental Health and their global network of U19 Global Mental Health and Implementation Science Scale-Up Hubs. And you'll hear a little bit about how Dr. Collins played an essential role in launching these important hubs around the world. Our other partners in this work include the Essence and Shine U19 Hubs and the University of Rwanda Center for Mental Health. So before I welcome Dr. Collins, I'd like to announce our next great seminar will be on April 28th at 10 a.m. Eastern time with Dr. Rohit Ramaswamy. Please visit the RBCA website for details on these events and how to register. If you're interested in watching past GRIT implementation science seminars, they can be found on the RPCA YouTube titled RPCA Lab SSW. Also, while I have the chance, I'd like to put in a little shameless plug that our lab is hiring for some very exciting implementation science positions. So if you're interested, please also check out the website or contact Tesla Abrego uh, for more information. And now I'm pleased to introduce today's great speaker, Dr. Pamela Collins. Dr. Collins is Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and Professor of Global Health at the University of Washington, where she is Executive Director of the International Training and Education Center for Health, or ITEC, at the UW Global Mental Health Program, an interdisciplinary program dedicated to the prevention and treatment of mental health conditions in low resource settings locally and around the world. Prior to her current role, she was Director of the Office of Research on Disparities in Global Mental Health in the Office of Rural Mental Health Research at the National Institutes of Mental Health, NIMH. Her leadership led to the launch of research initiatives to extend mental health services in Africa, Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East, as well as research to reduce mental health disparities among diverse racial and ethnic groups and indigenous communities in the United States. Now, Dr. Collins' own research focuses on the intersection of mental health and HIV care in the US and Sub-Saharan Africa, and the mental health needs of urban adolescents in the global context. She completed her undergraduate studies at Purdue and her MD from Cornell University Medical College and a Master of Public Health from Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health with residency training in psychiatry at Columbia and postdoctoral training at both Columbia and Harvard Medical School. Today, Dr. Collins will present on keeping mental health on the global agenda opportunities at the intersections. So we're so grateful to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Pamela, and over to you. Thank you so much, Teresa, and really lovely to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm gonna just quickly start by asking to understand a little bit about who's in the room. And if you have a minute, just put in the chat uh, a word or two about what you do, researcher, trainee, clinician, just to give me a sense of who's here. And I'll tell you a little bit about what I would like to cover in our time today. Researcher, postdoc, professor, researcher, MSW student, lots of MSW students. Great, 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 great. That gives me a bit of a sense. PhD students, program managers, PhD. So a really a good, a good range of people from across the uh, developmental <laughs> continuum in research and in different roles for with, with research, it sounds like. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It's good to, good to have that, that sense. So this morning, I'm going to really focus on two things. And let me first share my slides. Share screen. There we go. Um, I'm going to focus on two themes. And they're about equity. The one is around parity for mental health and global health. And I feel like this is something that all of us who are engaged in mental health, wherever we work in the world are going to, are, we're, we're constant advocates for this, for how do we ensure that people pay attention to the mental health needs of people who are receiving treatment for, for everything else. And the other is about equitable care and mutuality and, and partnerships. So I wanna talk about these these themes of equity, these different lenses on equity through the learning journeys of two centers today, the UW Global Mental Health Program and the International Training and Education for Center for Health. I'll do this by describing what they do and by linking them through the work that I do at the intersections of mental health and HIV.
And I want us to first reflect, can you imagine a world fully equipped to create and sustain the health and well-being of individuals, of each one of us, of our family members, and our communities in good times like this. This is a beautiful image of Nairobi. As well as in times of adversity like this, one in which we nimbly and compassionately respond to the mental health needs of children, of adolescents, and adults across the lifespan. I think this is what we're all here for. This time last year, my UW colleagues and I were preparing to meet our Nairobi-based co-investigators to launch the final phase of a study focused on competency-based training and psychological interventions for community health volunteers. This is work with the World Health Organization and uh, George Washington University and a consortium of wonderful colleagues from around the world. In our case, we were training community health volunteers to address trauma symptoms among children and adolescents in a Nairobi neighborhood and COVID-19 stopped us. Nairobi, like Seattle, launched its own quarantine measures and there as well as here and in so many places, people began to experience the emotional challenges of COVID. We ended up working with our colleagues in the health system in Nairobi and we were able to transform our training to a digital format with a focus on psychosocial support and the CHVs and the teenagers connected over cell phones. So this new support team referred youth with severe depression. They met young parents in need of emotional and material support, young people looking for a private place away from their parents so that they could share some of their struggles. And the needs were tremendous, as should not surprise anyone on this call. Because as you know, mental and substance use disorders are highly prevalent. And when we talk about global mental health, I always like to remind us that the global and global health refers to the scope of the problem, not to the location of the problems. And as such, we know that almost a, almost a billion people live with mental disorders globally. 2% of the global population, that's 161 million people live with substance use disorders. And these are leading causes of disability around the world. This is a global problem that requires global solutions. And the 1990 Global Burden of Disease Study, which you can see in the green, highlighted for the first time the magnitude of healthy years of life lost due to mental and substance use disorders. And we know that in normal times, health system responses are inadequate pretty much everywhere. And similarly, self-care and community supports cannot always meet the needs. COVID really just focused attention on this, which I think is helpful for us as we continue to make the case for why we have to pay attention to mental health. But 30 years ago, things were different. In the face of high rates of maternal mortality, infant and child mortality, a growing AIDS epidemic, the data on depression was a rallying cry to the mental health community about, yes, what we've been managing is important, and, but was anyone listening? And I would say that 30 years ago in 1990, when, this, when these studies of disease burden first began, not so much because non-communicable diseases accounted for less than half of the global disease burden. And as you can see from this image, what's the, the, the darker blue represent the countries that have a larger uh, burden of non-communicable diseases. And I'm gonna include mental disorders in that, or at least those are what stand out the most, right? With respect to um, disability adjusted life years. But in 1990, the AIDS epidemic and infectious diseases were really dominating uh, these, these data on disease, disease burden. And the AIDS epidemic saw its, saw its steepest increases during this time. With new infections, steepest, infec steepest rise in death and prevalence during those early years before treatment was available. So you're looking at the red showing new infections in the early 90s to mid 90s where they peak. The, this light blue is showing the number of people living with HIV and the dark blue is showing deaths from, a, from HIV, which were on the rise at that time. The response to the epidemic was powerful, however. People 
were dying and activists risked everything and the science accelerated, right? Right now, there's no part of the world that has not been affected by the AIDS epidemic. And today an estimated 38 million people live with HIV. And I emphasize live because HIV has become a chronic disease, which is the good news. And Kevin DeCock wrote a decade ago that HIV prevention and treatment scale up during the first decade of the 21st century qualifies as a game changer that has irreversibly changed perceptions of and approaches to global health. And this was due to rapid development and scale up of innovations like rapid HIV tests, early infant diagnostic tests, a willingness to change when new evidence appeared and to incorporate new activities from longstanding programs and importantly, targeted funding, targeted funding and unorthodox partnerships between community-based organizations, governments, civil society and professional societies. And what we saw from this was that the demonstration that treatment could work and save lives and could be delivered stimulated an enormous investment of donor funding. And this required people to bring their skills to bear to join this work of implementing, implementing treatment and people across the world, as well as here at EW responded to that call. And at that time, the International Training and Education Center uh, was launched, this was in 2002. It's currently the largest center in the Department of Global Health. It was funded by Ann Downer and King Holmes, now emeritus faculty here, and Michael Reyes, who is emeritus at the University of California at San Francisco. So in 2002, iTech was founded with a mission to work with partners to develop skilled healthcare workers and strong national health systems in resource limited countries. To do this, which iTech continues to do, we promote local ownership to sustain effective health systems. And I had the privilege of joining iTech as its executive director last July. There's a really strange red mark that I see on my screen and I can't tell if you can see that, but I'm not sure how to make it go away. We can see it and you can go up to annotate and then you can find the erase function and then say erase all drawings. Okay, do I need Thanks, to- Thanks, Donna. <laughs> do, do I have to uh, hang on? Let me see. If oh, I can... you got it. You got rid of it. I got rid of it. Okay. I did it. it we all set. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, so, iTech is a is a is is this incredible network that has supported programs in more than thirty countries and currently operates in seventeen. We have more than a thousand staff, consultants, clinical faculty, and contractors in Eastern Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, and through our partner uh, network countries in the Caribbean and in South Asia. The work that we do begins with and continues to support capacity development, including developing guidelines, leadership and management skills, workforce development, quality improvement, cl clinical mentoring. So this is the work of implementation, right? It's like, what do you do to equip a team to deliver quality services? What does that take at the different levels from the level of the ministry all the way to the level of the clinic that's delivering the care? <clears throat> We have a partnership models that emphasizes collaborative, respectful relationships that prioritize country needs and that transitions projects so that ideally they become part of national health systems to ensure sustainability. ITEC supports activities to, to control the AIDS epidemic and to meet the UN AIDS and the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief or PEPFAR targets of having 95% of people know their HIV diagnosis, 95% of those who are diagnosed are on treatment, and 95% of those on treatment have adequate adherence to their care so that they are virally suppressed. I'm gonna quickly go through some of these activities. We have a wonderful program with our colleagues in Zimbabwe at Zimtech with voluntary medical male circumcision that's averted more than 32 HIV, 32,000 HIV infections over the course of its eight years of activity. 
With Zimtech, we also work with iTech staff and contractors who partner with the Ministry of Health Clinicians to deliver HIV care and treatment. And right now, this team at Zimtech is really helping to guide a group of 10,000 people from community health workers all the way to nurses and physicians. In Haiti, iTech worked with uh, the Ministry of Health to develop ISANTE, the electronic medical record system, which is linked to laboratory information systems. So important for monitoring, testing, and being able to get results out to people. And I'll say a word about our cervical cancer campaign in Namibia, oops, um, which launched recently and has been ensuring that people have access to testing. And this is one of, I would say, this is, this is one example of how the work that we're doing is branching out to focus on co-occurring non-communicable diseases in HIV. And this work has been really critical during the COVID-19 pandemic where the team has been able to continue screening and getting women access to treatment for cervical cancer. In the Caribbean, our work has been focused on addressing the needs of vulnerable populations, actually training clinicians to recognize the needs of key populations, learning how to provide non-judgmental, comprehensive HIV care for people highest at risk. And finally, this platform really provides a rich environment for both implementing programs, but also layering research on top of this real world implementation. So you can see what happens when evidence, political will and investment coalesce around a health problem like HIV. And my question is, can we see an analogous trajectory or can we, can we actually help to continue to push that trajectory in the field of mental health? And I'll talk a little bit about um, how we're doing that at UW. But I wanna go back to the story that early in the AIDS epidemic, a small number of researchers and clinicians recognized and began to draw links between HIV and mental health in the US and in other countries, recognizing first that people living with HIV had elevated rates of depression and anxiety, twice the general population in the US and certainly elevated rates of post-traumatic stress disorder, largely due to the kinds of adversities people faced. And in the US, clinicians began to notice that people with severe mental illnesses were at increased risk of HIV infection, history of homelessness, experience of sexual violence, early sexual debut, drug or alcohol use, all of which were risks for HIV infection. And you can see that in the US, the risk, the prevalence of HIV in people with severe mental illness is a four to tenfold difference from the general population. But this is not unique to the United States. This was also, this is also true in uh, many other countries. This is just an example of HIV prevalence among women in Uganda, recognizing that the prevalence is much higher among women with uh, serious mental illness. And this lovely meta-analysis from The Lancet just a few years ago also showed that we can look at these numbers in regionally around the world and again, see that the prevalence among people living with uh, serious mental illnesses is significantly elevated. And this has been a key, a key aspect of putting, also putting mental health on the global agenda. Building mental health activities into HIV related activities in the 1990s and the early 2000s became a route to addressing mental health care and substance use disorder care needs, particularly for socially marginalized communities in the US and in other countries, especially countries hard hit by the epidemic. So integrating it with mental health um, was important then and it's important now. And I wanna say a little bit about why before we move on. There have been a number of studies, an increasing number of studies sh showing the relationship of depressive symptoms, for example, to AIDS-related mortality. Lovely work has come out of Tanzania, both showing the same relation that increased depressive symptoms lead to greater mortality among people living with HIV. These are data from the US, again, showing this dose-response relationship between depression length and HIV outcomes, such that every 
25% increase in days with depression leads to a 19% increased risk of mortality. And more recently, I think even just last month, there was a study out of Tanzania linking depressive symptoms to uh, non, non suppression of, of virus for HIV. So again, recognizing that this is important. But equally important as this data has been this ongoing advocacy over the last 30 years, calling out the need to redress disparities in mental health care between and within countries with the 2007 Lancet series explicitly issuing a call to action on mental health in low and middle income countries, NIMH responded and I had the opportunity to join the Institute and help lead that response as Teresa mentioned by developing a global mental health portfolio through our Office for Research on Disparities in Global Mental Health. We launched the Grand Challenges in Global Mental Health Study that identified priorities and brought more research funders to respond to this call. This was further strengthened by the Sustainable Development Goals as well as the Mental Health Action Plan from, from the World Health Organization, which has now been extended to 2030, I think most of you probably know. Further strengthened by the Sustainable Development Goals, which explicitly called out the need to address mental health. And then of course, the Lancet Commission, which laid out a path for what we could do, what we can do now, recognizing where we've had challenges, but how to go forward in global mental health. Over the past two years, I've had the pleasure of joining the Global Mental Health Program at U University of Washington and leading this where many of our faculty are leading impactful research and research capacity building around the world. And over the last couple of years, um, we've taken time to strategize around how we can contribute to global efforts. This is just a picture of our external advisory board. We've brought people who can keep us honest and give us critical input. Uh, they bring their own expertise from the US, from Latin America, from Asia, Africa, and Europe, and from their experience in multilateral organizations. And our specific goal is to, oops, sorry. Our specific goal is to develop tests and build a capacity to deliver contextually relevant and appropriate sustainable models for mental health intervention with our local partners and global partners. And how do we do this? We do this by understanding, understanding the context, right? Understanding the best, figuring out the best models to understanding the context and where intervention needs to happen by building workforce capacity to deliver mental health services and by elevating mental health on the global agenda. And I think that this emphasis and kind of reiteration of the importance of integration is one of the ways of, inter of building, elevating mental health on the global agenda. Reiterating that caring for people's mental health needs needs to happen in primary care, in HIV care, in maternal child care, in chronic disease care, and all of the ways that we provide health services to people. And beyond that, in the ways in which we engage our society in health promoting activities. So, these are some of our priority populations. We have a focus on women in the peripartum, children and adolescents, refugees and immigrants, and an emerging focus on people with serious mental illness. This is the home of the collaborative care model of integrating mental health into primary care. And so integrated care is, is really one of the main uh, pieces of our bailiwick, what we do here, figuring out how to do that in different contexts with different populations and in differently resource settings. Most of our faculty work with people with common mental disorder, so anxiety, depression, trauma. Um, and we have a lot of folks here at UW who focus on serious mental illness and substance use disorders. And this is something that we recognize many, many underserved communities um, in our region and globally don't get enough access to, and we'd like to figure out how to do that piece better. So that's an emerging area for us. I'm gonna talk a bit about what some of our work looks like in these pillars and priorities. So understanding gaps and opportunities in diverse communities. We partner with WHO in the Special Initiative for Mental Health. This was the World Health Organization's initiative to promote universal health coverage and to attain scale up of mental health services in countries around the world. Starting with six countries, Bangladesh, Jordan, Ukraine, Zimbabwe, the Philippines and Paraguay. 
And our team worked with teams from each of these countries to do a situational analysis, a baseline situational analysis on the status of the mental health systems, where the unique innovations are and where the needs are as they launch this initiative. Some of the other ways in which we're trying to understand gaps and opportunities is through our work with urban adolescents. We're working with partners in our population health initiative here at UW, which tries to look across the university to figure out how we can solve health problems. Urban at UW, which is a group that focuses on urban health, every aspect of it, from the built environment to um, homelessness. We're also partnering with Cities Rise, the University of Melbourne, to conduct a Delphi process, a survey that's, that has asked people around the world to identify the priorities for youth mental health in cities. What would it look like to build cities that are healthy for young people and what are those priorities? So we're in the process of finishing this data collection and figuring out how this can inform implementation activities at the policy level and um, at the community level. With respect to building the workforce, I would say much of our work focuses in this area of building the workforce, but this requires understanding health systems and community resources to identify and develop new cadres of mental health care providers. Shannon Dorsey, one of my colleagues here, has been leading this work in East Africa with her partners, focusing on children and adolescents and showing that task shifted delivery of an evidence-based intervention, in this case, they were focusing on trauma-focused CBT, is effective in community centers. And these are examples of data from Kenya, as well as data from Tanzania. As I mentioned uh, at the start of this work, we have been working with uh, the World Health Organization's EQUIP platform, ensuring quality and psychological support, which is focused on saying that if we, where we, where we need to do task shifting, which I think is pretty much everywhere in the world, um, how do we ensure that we can develop a competent workforce that can deliver quality care by using competencies uh, that are shared across a number of psychological interventions and building this competency-based training into the training of lay health workers. In 2019, before in the, I guess it was in around October of 2019, we were working with our colleagues in Nairobi using the EQUIP platform, leveraging the work that Shannon and colleagues have been doing in Western Kenya and our 30 year relationship with the University of Nairobi to conduct training of community health volunteers to work in specific informal settlements in Nairobi for children who've been exposed to adversity. This work is also happening with my colleague Ian Bennett, who is doing workforce development through collaborative care by adopting the collaborative care model for use in Vietnam. And this is underway now. So they're doing formative work to figure out what does this look like? What, is, what does it look like to use collaborative care in the context of perinatal care in community clinics? And this work builds on eight years of relationship uh, with Kantau University of Medicine and Pharmacy, which began by um, visiting, getting engaged in helping to train medical students and residents and uh, clinicians across different specialties and grew this relationship with, uh, with psychiatry and the other mental health care providers in that area. I'll talk a bit about our work with building workforce capacity with severe mental illness. Brad Wagonar, one of our junior faculty has doing, been working in Mozambique with Health Alliance International, another of our UW related um, centers using the systems analysis and improvement approach, which is a multi-step evidence-based implementation strategy that's used by a manager or a healthcare provider teams to systematically identify and address bottlenecks in their own healthcare delivery systems, and then prioritize the solutions. So they are applying the treatment cascade for people with serious mental illness in Mozambique. So trying to track how many people are diagnosed how many people that are diagnosed get access to care? How many people that are get access to care get on treatment and then are adherent to treatment and ultimately have better outcomes? And SIA helps to optimize this cascade. 
Jor Benzev, another colleague, is focusing on a, a diverse set of providers. He's leading the MHealer project where we're working with colleagues at University of Ghana to engage, well, to engage people that seek care at seek care at prayer camps, but mainly to engage the healers that are working in these facilities um, that are faith-based healing centers throughout West Africa where many people receive mental health services. And the goal of M Healer is to create psychosocial support tools for these traditional and alternative providers as they manage the care of people with serious mental illness. So it's giving people another resource to add to their um, armamentarium and giving people resources that are aligned with the evidence and with human rights driven care. I'll say one more word about um, building, building a workforce. And this is the work of Lori Zollner and her colleagues who work with community members, both in our region, as well as in Somaliland. They've developed the Islamic Trauma Healing, a mosque-based culturally tailored intervention that uses evidence-based components of care for traumatic stress. They have conducted this research um, in the Seattle area with the Somali community here, as well as in Somaliland. And this has been very exciting work that's, that is truly led by community members. These are, there, there are no kind of formal mental health therapists doing this work. These are people who are in the community who are building this, building the work and, and delivering it. Okay, I actually can't see the chat, so I'm gonna keep moving and then get to the questions. Um, so another example of building this work through collaborative care, we've talked about now integrating mental health into maternal child care. We've talked a little bit about doing this in HIV and I'll come back to that. But this is an example of building the workforce through integrating um, a collaborative care approach into non-communicable disease care. So Mo Ali and colleagues at Emory and colleagues in, at multiple sites in India um, also work with our colleagues, Lydia Trusiak and Deepa Rao in the independent study, which was successful in integrating depression care and diabetes and hypertension care in a collaborative care model. And what was really nice is that this model specifically showed great outcomes with respect to reducing depressive symptoms in the context of this care. And this group is actually now analyzing, I think their 36 month follow-up data. So we'll see where that takes them as well. So coming full circle back to HIV and mental health and to iTech, I think I mentioned iTech as a platform, a platform that implements care directly, but also as a platform for research. And one of the NIMH hubs, the Southern African Research Consortium for Mental Health actually layered its Im implementation science activities on top of the implementation activities at iTech through the mental health integration program, which was really a PEPFAR and CDC funded implementation of training um, of community health workers and lay, uh, lay people to deliver mental health services in the context of primary care. So MIT used a collaborative care model, including based in primary care, engaging nurses, engaging uh, mental health counselors <clears throat> to identify people with depression and to manage depression. And this work is ongoing and very exciting. The implementation product project was conducted in KwaZulu-Natal and in Pumalanga. And as I said, the data collection is still happening there. And in addition, this group is working to do research capacity building in Mozambique, Malawi, Tanzania, and South Africa. And finally, ITEC Mozambique and Health Alliance International with PEPFAR work that is also led by Brad Wagonar and supported by Shannon Dorsey, has been, did a wonderful pilot test of the integration of the common elements treatment approach. So a transdiagnostic psychological intervention into public HIV care in Beira City in Sofala, Mozambique. And the preliminary findings revealed a high prevalence of mental distress and suicidal ideation among people attending the clinic. And after four sessions of CETA, mental health symptoms decreased by 50%, suicidal ideation decreased 100%, and CETA patients had 9% higher one month retention in care and 19% higher three month retention in HIV care 
compared to all HIV positive patients. The exciting piece of this is that um, this is now being scaled up across the country. So they're in the midst of working out the challenges of scaling, going from a pilot study to something much larger. And I'm gonna move to our final pillar, which is elevating mental health on the global and local agenda. So how do we use this evidence base that we've gathered and that we continue to gather to increase access to care for people who need and want mental health services? And one of the ways we're doing this is through collaborations with multilateral organizations. We supported UNAIDS in developing the background document for its first program coordinating board focusing on integrating HIV and mental health care. And excitingly, this work has stimulated countries to push for UNAIDS to develop guidance on mental health integration, which is a project that I continue to work with UNAIDS and the World Health Organization around. But we're also trying to figure out how to get this word out through other, through other routes and collaborating with our colleagues at United for Global Mental Health, um, who've been really helping to guide people like us, researchers, to figure out how, how can we synthesize the evidence and disseminate it at critical junctures, at critical junctures when advocacy is needed. And this is a commentary that briefly describes why mental health is important to the HIV and TB epidemics and how the Global Fund can help to integrate it. And we partnered with our colleague, Annika Sweetland, who's at Columbia, who's one of the one of the small community of people really pushing for integrating HI or TB and depression care around the world. <coughs> Excuse me. We're really excited that we just, we just got funded with a new center grant from NIMH that will focus on HIV and mental health integration. Uh, and we actually start this week. <laughs> so a lot of this work that we've been doing uh, globally as well as regionally will be taken into the HIV, our new HIV developing HIV center um, and will enable us to build these bridges and firm these bridges with iTech, with global mental health and with colleagues beyond our institution. And I hope that some of you will be interested in joining us in this work because I'm sure we, can, we, could, we would benefit from your input as well. So I just wanna take us back to where we are now. We know that now is the real time to invest in mental health care for many reasons. Non-communicable diseases, including mental disorders, are rapidly decreasing as the, as the um, I'm sorry, <laughs> NCDs, including mental health, mental health problems, are rapidly increasing as the leading causes of lost years of healthy life. And you can see that the left side of this graph is showing the decrease in communicable disorders maternal disorders and nutritional disorders. So this rate of decrease has actually accelerated over the last 30 years and particularly in the last decade, while the rate of increase in the non-communicable disease burden has accelerated. So this is part of our case for saying it's time to make sure that we are continually advocating for mental health. And again, you can see the shifting colors where now the majority of healthy years life lost across the world are due to non-communicable diseases. Equally important, however, is how we do this work in global health. And we do so with a focus on equity and a serious look at what it takes to build our vision of global health, which is equitable access to healthcare, and beyond that, to healthy lives sustained in healthy communities. Deepa Rao and I wrote the call to action this year for the World Federation of Mental Health as it kicked off World Mental Health Day, making clear that the current conversation that we're having about racism in the United States has individual consequences, and that also has consequences for how we work internationally. And the global mental health community has to respond to these. We need to think through how we collaborate. We need to think through what equity means in partnerships. And I think we need to move towards mutuality, recognizing that I can say for sure that we need more perspectives on how to deliver mental health services and how to meet the mental health care needs of diverse populations in the United States. And we want to hear from people. We want to hear what you're learning in your context. We want to be able to take it, take advantage of what you're generating, the knowledge that, that, that we're all generating, um, and figuring out how we, can, how we can riff off of those ideas and um, enable them to, to meet the needs that we have while also meeting the needs that other people have. So 
um, at iTech, we are also focusing on these issues of equity and transition. And we're supporting the transition of our country offices that have traditionally been part of the University of Washington into independent entities. This increases the likelihood that these organizations will continue to re receive funding to carry out their programs. And it also increases the autonomy and the ability for these indigenous organizations to learn and to develop as fully fledged um, entities who then can access other sources of resources. I'm gonna pause here because I, I think that this is, these are key questions that our fields are grappling with now that global health is grappling with the issue of power, right? Which says who makes decisions, who decides on how to allocate resources who has the power to make these decisions? Who gives them that power and who backs up that power? And how do we remember the needs that we all have in sharing power <laughs> and the needs that we ultimately have for, for better health? I wanna acknowledge the faculty and staff at iTech who contributed slides for this, as well as my team with the UW Global Mental Health Program. Let me stop here and I'm gonna stop sharing and I would love to open the floor for a conversation in our last 15 minutes or so. Fabulous, Pamela, thank you so much. So uh, feel free to add your questions to the chat. I see we have some really wonderful attendees today who are also contributors to this field. And Greg, you had a great question in the chat. Do you wanna ask your question directly to Pamela? How can We're happy to do that. Um, hey, Greg. Hi there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Collins. Wonderful talk. Um, so I, you know, we've been talking about capacity in country, but there's also the, um, the research and purveyor capacity. So my question was that you know, a number of people highlighted um, in your talk, um, Drs. Dorsey, Bennett, Wagonar, and Dr. Betancourt were alum of the NIMH Implementation Research Institute. Um, and I'm just wondering about your thoughts on how fellowships and training programs such as IRI and others can help build awareness capacity and impact um, in mental health globally. Yeah, I think these are great ways of doing I think, I mean, first of all, the fact that you know all of these people, there's a cohort power, right? <laughs> With these kinds of programs. You know, we have, a, we have a doctoral program in implementation science in our Department of Global Health uh, here at UW. And, we are increasingly bringing in more folks coming to train in mental health, global mental health implementation science specifically. And this creates a cohort. And I think those, those relationships that enable people to train together. And what we need to do though, is figure out how to structure those training programs so that, so that people at UW and Boston College and um, anywhere are also training with people in Rwanda and they're training with people in Peru and they're training with people in South Africa. <laughs> and this training actually happens and we build these global cohorts, right? So that um, that's just gonna enrich the way that we learn from each other. And I think the earlier we start to figure out, it's just, it also just reminds me of that, you know, we've, there's been a conversation around interprofessional training for a long time and the values of interprofessional training. It, this makes me think of, um, this kind of international training, but in, a, in the global sense, right? So how can we actually build cohorts of people who know each other from early in their careers as trainees um, who are coming from very different contexts, but come together and figure out how to solve these problems, these complex problems around implementation um, that are happening. And, and I think recognize where the similarities are because there are often similarities. I mean, we here, the, the Pacific Northwest is, fascinating. I mean, Teresa can tell you this <laughs> because it's a really under-resourced region of the United States, right? I mean, it's one of these places where collaborative care grew here because there aren't that many specialists in this part of the country. It's a, it's a vast amount of land with a lot of rural <laughs> areas and a few large cities. And Seattle, I think, is the, the big city. Um, but we, we, all, we are also wrestling with these with similar questions. So I would love for us to figure out how do we have some global training opportunities that actually bring people from across different economies and different, different countries, different cultural contexts, different health system contracts, contexts to learn how to do implementation science and global mental health? 
I see another one that, sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. No, we're with you on that, especially being from Alaska. I can tell you all the stuff we're doing in West Africa and Rwanda, you know, has real implications for work in the indigenous communities there. Um, yeah, go ahead, Pamela. You can probably, can you see the chat? I can see them now, yep. So how do we suggest that we can obtain funding at NIH for integrated implementation healthcare research, such as mental health and TB or mental health and diabetes? Yeah, I think I see Rhonda on this call. So <laughs> we, we shout louder into Rhonda's ear. <laughs> um, but you but were yeah. at the NIH for many years too. So I thought you might have some ideas about yeah. um, this issue of integrated type of research when we have these vertical institutes at NIH, but it seems like some people, including yourself and others at UW have been successful with this. Well, one of the things that we did when I was at NIH, we simply, we developed initiatives focused on this kind of integration. I mean, that was one of my priorities. So we put out calls for proposals, asking people. We had a conference where we invited NHLBI and NIMH and NICHD, all of these different institutes, right, to come together um, at the launch of an initiative <laughs> to write, we wrote a series together about integrating mental health into maternal child health, into um, NCDs, into all of these areas and engaged our colleagues across the different institutes. Um, but then we put money behind it so that we could actually fund initiatives that would, that would, that would do this kind of integration. So I think we need more of that because that clearly is the way that, um, particularly in the, in the lowest resource settings, you know, mental health is gonna happen through channels that exist, right? And so ensuring that we can see what that look, what does that look like in Liberia? What does that look like in Sierra Leone? What does that look like in a South Africa? What does that look like in Alaska? What does that look like in, um, in very different kinds of healthcare contexts? So, that had, there, is a, there is a precedent for that, Donna, at NIH, so that, that can certainly continue. I'm looking I'm at, sure, I'm looking at Jane West's question. In, in what has, what does your, wait, what does your work with lay health, health workers, paid and volunteer, establish a mental health baseline of each person? Are you asking, I think you're asking, did we establish a mental health baseline of each person pre-training pre you want to ask your question? Yeah, there you go. Why don't you ask? <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's almost as early as it is for you, so my fingers are waking up now. <laughs> but yes, the question is knowing how much potential unresolved loss and trauma as just examples and how they might manifest in mental health disorders uh, can be in a population and then to elevate people to be trained to be the caregivers or the community workers come to the risk to their own well-being um, and, the, and the sustainability of the work. So I'm just wondering if that's something you're tackling through the various projects you mentioned that work with frontline workers. Thank you. Yeah, that's, thank you, that's a great question. Yeah, that's a great question. I, and I would say that the model that the, the colleagues that I work with and the model for each of these has been that number one, frontline workers are, are not alone in doing, in doing any of this work. Um, our work in Nairobi, we were the, these frontline workers were backed by a group of psychologists uh, who work for the, the county and were there to supervise them, to uh, refer. And we, you know, we adapt this work in the midst of a, an incredibly busy time for them because they were also trying to figure out, as you rightfully point out, what could they be doing as the, you know, the city, the county mental health resource to support the mental health of healthcare workers who were basically, you know, who were fighting COVID, right? So there was a there was an there was a shift in this particular system to how do we support healthcare workers and how do we continue to support the the needs of the, the population. But there was this, and I would say everyone's conclusion was that we need more resources to do this. We, we, have, we don't have enough providers to do this and we need to figure out how to extend the mental health resources that we have. And COVID in particular just sort of laid, made much more of that apparent. Um, 
but the system itself was set up to to layer this kind of support. So the frontline workers, you're absolutely right. They had weekly supervision in this period of time. Um, and I think those kinds of things need to continue. But we were very careful, very careful to make sure that we were supporting them being, being cognizant of what they were facing on a daily basis, being cognizant of the frustrations that they were experiencing. And yeah, this needs, this this kind of I think that kind of support I think all of, all of you who work in this area of task shifting know this right that this is a this is a critical piece that um, that needs a lot of that needs a lot of care the supervision the ongoing support how you do that what are the best models of doing that in in each setting needs a lot of needs a lot of attention um, Larry do you want to ask your question directly. If I, can, if I can unmute my video, my apologies for the late draw. Hi, hi Pamela. Um, fantastic uh, overview and, and inspiring set of ideas. The issue of integration into other existing channels and service systems. Is, any thoughts about the integration of mental health into education systems in these communities and countries, uh, especially given your priority populations of children and youth and refugees and IDPs, and with some uh, also thoughts about priority diagnoses. Right, so this is a great question. And, and I would say Shannon in our group, Shannon Dorsey is the person who is really leading that work around what does this look like in schools, right? How do you work with that? How do you work not just with the, with the teachers? How do you then link to involving um, community supports and then how do you begin to work with school systems, right? What does that look like? We have a, you know, I can, there, we have a, a group here in Seattle, here at UW, that's also doing this work in school systems and trying to figure out what do integrated approaches to mental health look like in the school system? Everything from what is the need of an individual child? How does that link to what family needs are? What do those needs look like um, as a school needs to, think about kids with identified serious mental health problems to kids at risk, to kids whose mental health you wanna sustain and promote. So I would say that, yes, we need to be, we should be thinking about this in education systems everywhere. I am not the expert in uh, integrating mental health into schools, but I know that there are a lot of people who are, who have done There's And there was a nice review, at least from it's a few years old now though, but looking at different kinds of life skills interventions and other sorts of whole school versus um, specific mental health interventions in schools and low and middle income countries as well. So indeed the, the life, there's a bridge that's potentially being built from the education side in an increasing global interest in social emotional learning and, and life skills. And that seems like a very uh, proximal point of potential contact with the mental health work, so. No, absolutely. And I think that mental health people wanna own that work too, right? So that's my that's my sense. Undoubtedly, you mean co-own it. <laughs> right, that's, <laughs> thank you. Thank that's, you. The, that's the point you made for a half hour today. Yeah. Re really yeah. important point. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I guess see I, a, another question from Greg that I'm gonna tag on to because uh, of, of some of the specificity of fragile in conflict affected settings. But Greg also mentioned, he's wondering about the larger socio-political context in low and middle income countries, how we can do better at engaging ministries of health and policies to further expand this work. And I think for us working in Sierra Leone, the fragility factor, the fact that you know, you've know you got two psychiatrists for 8 million people, you have no budget for health, you've got Ebola after effects, let alone trying to get mental health in there education systems where there's, you know, people still having to pay, you know, fees to overcome barriers, especially in secondary school access. So, you know, how do we, in those kind of contexts, think about engaging ministries of health and arriving at policies and financing, especially in fragile settings? And have you seen examples, Pamela, where this can actually work? <laughs> 
my guess is, Teresa, that you, you've seen more examples of this in fragile or, well, or Rwanda, not. <laughs> I would say Rwanda is also, you know, coming out of the genocide has done um, really amazing things. I and mean, we have some colleagues and I know a colleague wants to ask a question from Rwanda. Um, but we've felt frustrated in Sierra Leone because people are remiss to invest there because, you know, it's perceived as not going to give them the payoff that they'd like to see if they spend their money in a Kenya or a Uganda. And we find that some funders don't understand fragility. Um, so I think this just, it's a um, raising awareness, but I think in other countries, there are examples at engaging ministries of health and, and you've probably seen that. Yeah, I mean, I would ask you, Teresa, what if, you know, in, in 10 seconds, what is that message of a reassurance, right? To funders that are, that are reluctant or hesitant to support, you know, a, a fragile state. I mean, what is that message of reassurance that you would want them to hear? Yeah, I would say that with the partnerships we've developed, especially, you know, long-term ones that have adapted to all the turnover, um, that if we can do it there, we can do it anywhere. We're worth the investment because the innovation you have to arrive at is so massive. And it can apply to native Alaskan communities and low resource settings with Somali refugees in the United States. And that mutual learning that you were talking about, that mutuality is really powerful in those settings. So don't be freaked out yeah. <laughs> would be my message. Like um, but uh, above all, just Pamela, we can't thank you enough for your leadership in the field and all that you've done. And it's really, you know, exciting to see, you know, the, the, the past era and your, your sort of imprint on it. And it's just an honor to have you here today. And we look forward to seeing what you do um, next and, you know, working along the way with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the so, invitation. Uh, we're at times. Yes, thank you for being here today. And thanks everyone for a really rich discussion. Look forward to seeing you at our next GRIT seminar. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye.